Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. We got Drew behind the camera and at the editing desk, and today from across the country, we've got a friend, Chris, who is with DCM Consulting. DCM, D D D D Dutch. Dutch. I was trying to come up with something better than your name. So your nickname's Dutch. Yes. Last name is Moyer. Yep. You spent uh, 14 years in one of the Army's premier school, the Army's premier special missions units. Almost 14, exactly. And then you, uh, Army Ranger before that. Yep. And then before that, you were a tanker. I was an armor crewman. All right, very cool. And now you run a business that does consultation and training. Yes, sir. You work with some friends of ours like Pat McNamara. You guys were just doing some stuff with uh, 10th Mountain. And we will be doing stuff with 10th Mountain here real soon. Very cool. And your dog, were a dog handler trainer. Was. Mm hmm Still are. You've been whispering to my cockapoo the last day that you've been here. <laughs> oh, Chucky, she's awesome. Mm-hmm. So you came out, we're gonna talk about uh, your life some, talk about some of the things that are important to you. Uh, we're gonna film some videos on uh, single man CQB and why that sucks, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Not, not for you guys, it's not from the perspective of war fighting, but hey, I gotta go through my house because there's a bad guy or guys that came in, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. You'll have to wait for those videos, so welcome. Thanks. Appreciate you. No, oh, man, I appreciate the time, uh, the camaraderie already. We just started, and the camaraderie has been awesome. Lovely. So, so you uh, live in uh, Fort Bragg area? Uh, Moore County, North Carolina. Okay, and you um, do what now? Just, you know, if somebody said, like, you know, what's the elevator pitch? Who's Dutch? I pretty much do what you do. So Dick jokes? <laughs> buffoonery, chicanery. <laughs> um, <laughs> Less, probably less than the dick joke than you do, but you know, I'm like, I could do that. Uh, movie quoter, right? So, professional movie quoter, um, you know, professional. Give me a movie quote. Buffoon. Oh, this is my safety. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we talk about all the time. Or too much mind. Too much mind. What was that one from? So that's from uh, the the Boken fight. Oh yeah. That Tom Cruise's character which in is Captain, Last Samurai. Captain. Uh, What's this? I don't remember, but yes. Yeah, I gotta, yeah, and so, yeah, he can't get it right, right? He can't finish it. And uh, the younger samurai guy comes up and says, you, you're too much of mine. He thinks too much. So that you can translate that to a lot of stuff. <clears throat> How many times you see people just trying to pull the trigger so hard and they can't get it right? Too much of mine, man. Relax. Just do the thing. Let the, let the machine work. It's going to work. Just pull the triggers. Frank Proctor says, let it do. Let it do. That's, let that's, it do. It's great. You know? <laughs> yeah. So many people want to just make it go off, and they just can't. You know, And it's an art form. It's a, you, I think you have to admit this. It's an art form to a degree. Uh, Mike Voigt used to talk about it. God bless him. He you know, pulled the trigger without moving the gun. Mm -hmm. it's not, it sounds mm -hmm. easy, but... The pistol's so unforgiving, so it's, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, yeah, so now I train, uh, I predominantly have been training military and law enforcement, but uh, I am certainly expanding to open enrollment of select Americans. So. What's your specialty? <clears throat> I guess I would, you know, on the website or whatever, it's going to say pistol, rifles. But I mean, like, what are you like best at? Like, if somebody, like, if a group of dudes that are listening, like, oh, I own a range in any town USA, like, what are you good at? Yeah, I, um, rifle, pistol, CQB. That's what I would say. I mean, and they say, and they say, like, well, so is five hundred other dudes. Yeah, you're right. So, like, what do you bring to the? So, all right, under the banner of leadership and thirty years of experience over thirty-one, um, and then really the training through the crucible of combat. Right. So I have. 10, I have 12 combat deployments, but 10 were really meaty, right? 10, I, I held a rifle and did things. The other two were more like liaison work, so I didn't do anything in those deployments. But, um, you know, we're talking 120 day deployment. You're out the door almost 120 times. And so you do 10 times 10, you're, you're looking at a thousand or more. And how many structures have you cleared? I don't know, but over a thousand close quarter battle hits mostly against an armed enemy. So I bring that to the table. It's pretty significant. Um, I bring, again, 
I think everything is over the banner of leadership, really, right? So young men or women, they need guidance. Um, I've done I've done a bunch of speeches for high school football teams. Oh, cool. And uh, I really like working the, the idea that these young people need guidance. Yeah. Um, and you do it around the platform of a pistol or a rifle. And then law enforcement, I want to bring back to law enforcement what they don't have. They don't have time to train. They don't have the monetary funds to train. Uh, so many constabularies train one time a year, and it's qualification day. Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah, we talk about that a lot in Give our program. People a break, man. Come on. You just were with mm -hmm. a department in Indiana. I don't want to say who, unless you want to, doing uh, training with their SWAT team. What does that look like when a when a department brings you on? What do you do? So one of the one of the first things I wanted would tell any department if, if they if I'm lucky enough to be selected to come help them train, I want to watch them train, and then I'll say, let's try these tools. Let's try that tool. What you know? Why are we doing what we're doing? Why? Let's let's dive deep into what's going to keep us alive. If it's a hostage rescue, if it's an active shooter, or if, you, if it's a deliberate target, right? Mm -hmm. When we say deliberate, well, we don't. We can protect the force. We don't have to go so fast down the hallway or use. You know, the, the tactics work best with four people, obviously. So, real free flow CQB works best with four people. The tactic does. But you know, how many guns do I want in the room? I want all of them in the room if I can get them. Uh, but then, of course, hostage rescue, you're down to two. So, you know, so deliberate, when I say deliberate action, you don't have to go in to a room with just two guys. You want all the guns in there if you can. Uh, but, you know, it always depends on the assets that the law enforcement officer has in the beginning. Uh, if, if your SWAT team is only 25 guys and your structure is very large, now you may have to chop your elements into pieces and you may have to clear two guys at a time. And then it goes into the CQB stuff, you know, what, when's the best time to do singleton CQB? Never. But as a law enforcement officer, for sure, at times, he may be on his own. Mm -hmm. um, the call comes out, there's an active shooter, he may have to do it by himself. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, you may find yourself doing one-man CQB. Which that's took 20-some-odd years for that tactic to change after Columbine. Go to the sound of the gunfire now, not hold and wait for the... The SWAT team. You have to go. You, know, mm -hmm. you have to go. Mm -hmm. People are dying in there. You have to go. Mm -hmm. And then that's when speed is your security, uh, if you can manage it. And then hopefully that's why law enforcement officers wear level three plus or level four. Uh, these guys that I just trained in Indiana wear level four. Go do they? And uh, we used to say that you wear the armor. This is why you can get close to really determine is that you know through the smoke or through the haze or through the chaos. Is this person really the one you want? Is he holding the gun? Is he not holding the gun? You know, how close do I need to get to make that accurate shot or determine as I'm moving to my point of domination and it's cloudy in there, it's smoky in there, or it's dark, you know, and does my light work right now? And whatever other variables that might be, you know, that's why you're wearing level four. Mm -hmm. So you can get in there, get close, and sometimes, you know, uh, bad things happen. So that's it. So all these years that you put into that culminated in who you are now let's talk about that talk a little bit about your career uh 31 years total right so i joined the army when i was a young man thinking that uh i was looking back here there's a george Patton book in here somewhere right i know it's a good book and right there yeah, right there yeah so i'm a big fan of george Patton. Uh, i'm a big fan of erwin rommel uh, i loved the combined arms warfare type stuff, the Blitzkrieg, right? So I, when I was a kid, right, I was learning about that. And I wanted to be a tanker. I really wanted to see what it was like to, you know, be at the spearhead and drive deep into the enemy territory or whatever, you know, in your tanks. Uh, and so I did that. So I joined the Army and became a tanker. And I joined the Army in 1981, so it's dating myself. And uh, loved it. And then I liked the tank. I loved the combat of, I loved the, the idea of the combined arms, everything. But I will tell you the army in the eighties was less full of leadership than it needed to be, especially my element in Germany. Uh, drug use was rampant. Alcoholism was rampant. Uh, the leaders were not as strong as they should have been. I was looking for more. Uh, 
uh, and that time really in 86, I got out of the Army in 86, uh, made my sergeant, I was headed for staff sergeant, and uh, I was like, this is, these people suck here, they just suck, I'm looking for more. When you say that, thinking back to some of the people that you served with, uh, do you think they'll hear you and be like, geez, what a dickhead. No, they'll probably go, yeah, it really did suck. <laughs> okay. That's what I would think. And then look, it's a, it's a fair assessment, I don't I mean, it is what it is. What it is. I wanted more professionalism, right? I wanted more. I wanted something I didn't even know. I didn't even think about U.S. Army Rangers, 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne. I didn't think that I would even possibly go back and look at this. So, but I did. So I, I started taking jobs. I, I took small jobs. Uh, UPS. I was a supervisor. I was a bartender. Um, but I wanted to go back. So... There was the BEAR program, which I don't remember that acronym, uh, but it was a re, you could keep your rank and go back in the Army and then the Special Forces uh, pipeline type of thing. So that's what I wanted. I said, let's do that. So I started gearing up for that. I, I jumped out of an airplane as a civilian. I went to scuba school as a civilian. Just so that you had been yeah. exposed to these things. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, long story short, man, my, my whole career changed completely because. A guy lost my paperwork. I couldn't get into that. I went to a, my particular National Guard group. It was the 19th Special Forces. We did a pre-course in Fort Ord, California. It was very tough for me. I loved it. Um, I wasn't good at swimming at the time, though, so I had to, I had to ramp that up. But uh, passed everything there. I was excited to get, you know, this is, what I, this is what I can do. I can go to the SF. And uh, long story short, uh, lost the paperwork, and everything went down the hill. From there, everyone went down the drain. I rejoined the Army under a 11 x-ray uh, contract. Um, got to, tell people what that is. The x-ray is, so 11 x-ray just means, 11 x means you're just going to go wherever the Army says so. And so, as, as 11 series. 11 series of the military occupational specialty is infantry. But that contains different pieces, right? There's 11 Bravo, there's 11 Charlie, there's 11 uh, Mike which is mechanized, and which somewhere during that time frame, I'm in the, the 30th AG, which is a replacement battalion for the, the whole basic NAIT programs. And I'm, I'm helping a guy, because I, I had some maturity. I was helping a, one of our, our leaders, if you will, working with guys that needed eyeglasses. Hmm. And I see my name on the thing there, and it says 11 Mike. And I said, I think I know what this means. This means I'm mechanized, right? And he says, yeah, they're going to send you to mechanize. And I said, I've been mechanized before, bro. Ceasefire. I, won't, I don't want that. I've done all this. And uh, he said, well, I think maybe you can, before you launch into basic and AIT again, you can probably change your contract. So I did. I went downstairs. I got help from two senior non-commissioned officers that were great. There were recruiters downstairs. One was a ranger. And I said, I want, I would like that ranger contract, please. I said, you're going to have to, you know, redo your contract for six more years. I was like, yeah, I'm here for the long haul, bro. I'm here for the 10. Give me whatever. So I, I actually got the Ranger contract, and I got into RIP, is what they called it then, Airborne School RIP, and then I went to the 1st Ranger Battalion. So I was much happier. And it was completely much more professional ever than it was in the 80s, ever. Um, you know, Ranger NCOs expected you to jump when you said so. Uh, when they said so, rather. And then I just entered as a young ranger. I was a specialist again. I lost my rank because of time. And I uh, came back in as a young infantry ranger in 175. And then you do the pipeline stuff. You know, you, they mark you for a leader. You, you're a pretty good leader. Let's, let's keep you here. So you got to go to ranger school. Every ranger leader in a ranger battalion or a ranger regiment needs to go through that ranger school to be to stay you mm -hmm. know, as an age ranger leader. So, and, uh, and then I wanted to be better, right? You, still, there's that inside of us, you know, the Rudyard Kipling thing we talked about. If you can do more, do better, why not try? At the very least, I think every man owes it to himself to try to be better. Um, a lot of people don't like that, though. No. It sucks when you look at yourself in the mirror and you, you either don't try or you don't like the idea of losing. Not so you losing. Just don't. Who likes the idea of losing? I don't mind it so much. 
I hate to lose, but it happens. I don't mean it from the perspective of, oh, I lost again, I enjoy it, but like that doesn't pers dissuade me from trying is what right. I meant. Yeah, that's what I, people, people so think. hate that concept that they just don't even. Or you're, in, you're intimidated. Yeah. But you owe it to yourself to keep trying, to keep being better. But, you know, am I better in all my fastest of life? No, I'm not. Yeah, but try to be try to be better. We've actually heard some rumors about some of the spots that you're not. Really, I'm exactly. Just I'm just no, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so the so, rumors are true. The struggle is real. So, so you're down in uh, Georgia. It's the late '80s, early '90s. At early this early '90s. Now, okay. Yeah. So okay. back in early '90s, I took about a. I think it was about a five year break, but I stayed affiliated. So. So when you look at the, the career breakdown, so I tell people I have 31 years of experience, which I do, but for regular Army purposes, I'm over 26. Okay. And I have about four and a half years of National Guard time in between. And that's where, as like I said, I was working for a UPS as a supervisor, uh, bartender, crap like that. So, yeah. So Savannah was awesome. 175 was awesome. Is where I cut my teeth in real Special Operations Command. Mm -hmm. uh, what rangers do airfield seizure raids ambushes you know long walks um discipline of course you're parachuting all the time so that's and then the next step was you know the recruiter visits and says you know here here's a here's a film we want you to watch and you may like this you may not but it may be for you it may not be would you like to do this and you see this video and you're like holy crap would love to do that. And that was the next step to me, the next professional evolution of my career was like, you know, do you want to try out for a higher level of of element mm -hmm. to work? And I said, yeah, I want to do that. So that's when JSOC comes calling and says, here's a recruiting video. Do you want to try this? And yes, I do. So you put it in a packet, you get your PT scores up where they need to be, and uh, you go. Try. What was some memorable moments in the time that you were down there in Savannah? What did you, what do you take away from that? I'm sure there's a million things, but like. That's a good question. I'm searching, right, in my memory, my, my gray matter. <clears throat> Working, again, so I was a, I was an older ranger coming back in, and uh, we talked about this a little bit last night, right? I've, I've seemed to have done things in my life late. Uh, I didn't launch as a young man, right? I know guys that all their career is, is just rangers and then just JSOC operator, and that's cool to me. It's very cool to me. That's a jaded life, right? Uh, but I, I did other things. But explain that to the people listening, because myself, you know, Drew behind the camera served. I did not, and a lot. I, I only understand some of this stuff just from having friends like you. So people listening are like, duh, 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 duh. they they just call me a friend. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> explain. <laughs> So, so like, why, why would that be jaded? You know, somebody would hear that and go, well, what, the, what, what does that mean? Because they never experienced. So if you were Special Operations Command or in JSOC, your Rangers are JSOC. They're part of the JSOC element. If you're in JSOC your whole entire career, you have a larger budget, you have better leaders, and you become jaded, man. That's You, you never suffered through regular Army buffoonery. So you're like, you're like a rich girl yeah. from Beverly Hills. Yeah. And it's, it's a great life. It's a great life. You know, we used to say, if you, you know, oftentimes, you're still in the Army, so you reach this pinnacle of, in your career in the greatest counter-terrorist element ever created by man. Uh, and I firmly believe that, and I don't care who's listening, it doesn't matter. Um, so if, you still, you're still in the Army, though, you still have to go to a school, you have to go to, you know, there, there are different acronyms now, so, you know, sue me. The primary leadership development course, everybody usually already has that before you get there, but maybe you have to go to BNOC, which is a basic non-commissioned officer's course, and then ANOC, which is advanced non-commissioned officer's course. And especially if you're going to be a sergeant major, you have to go to the sergeant major's academy. But all those times you go to those places, when you come back, you're like, that was, that was unit appreciation week. That was unit appreciation time, because now I'm back here, and I'm really excited to be back home because everybody cares what they do. Uh, you know, here's like any great organization, right? They comb through and pick through the best people, whether it's human resources, whether it's the, the lawyer, whether it's the psych, the medic, or, or the shooter. And it's a great time. 
to come back and go, yeah, that was whew, I'm so glad I'm back. Because, <laughs> again, you get jaded. Mm -hmm. uh, there's great people all around you. So Excellence. It really is. People pissing excellence. It really is. Um, all the guys that come from your places that I work with, I always enjoy it. My friend Matt always says, um, fire and forget it. Like he'll talk about it. He And he was not military. He was a copper, but... Um, like that's the guy you're looking for the fire and forget it guy and I, I being in business for years i appreciate people that like yeah yeah i'll get that handled and then like well are you gonna or are you not so most of the guys like z who i've done tons of work with or the guys from d-day we were talking about a minute ago like i know even if we don't talk for months i know if one of them tells me i'll be here on this day with this stuff i know they will well there's plenty of people that maybe have that background that turn into shitheads later in life. Sure. Yeah. Everybody, yeah, there's, look, we're, we're all capable of faults. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just a great, uh, it's be, to be part of that. Now, back to your question though, which I don't think I really answered. You didn't. Memor memorable uh, times in the first range of time. Uh, hard training, right? Hard training that was rewarded with camaraderie. Realistic, hard training, rewarded with camaraderie and it, and it kept going as, as I went up in my career but all right so you jump out of an airplane tactical jump uh, you assemble with your men uh, you know you, obviously the parachutes are gone their way right we put your rucksacks on and then you do a 25 miler tactical movement that leads you to a target Frago, right, which is a fragmentary order, and then it's operation order, quick, uh, quick Frago. Here's here's the enemy. We already have eyes on. You know, this is what we're going to do. You guys are going to support. You guys are going to assault, whatever. Go assault the structure. You know, it's and you everybody smoked, man. After 25 miles with you know 50, 60 pounds on, you smoked. Everybody's tired. Um, you hit the target though, and then when it's all over, first sergeant brings up the truck. Drops, drops off a bunch of uh, pallets, lights a fire, they bring chow in, you know, you're tired, you're worn out, boom, camaraderie, now it's finished, now here's your reward. And uh, we do the same kind of, I've done this before too, when I, I worked briefly at a place in South Carolina where we, it was almost a, like, a, like a company junket. So we took, I think there was 40 guys, we split them into two teams, and we gave them the same kind of mission. We said, you're gonna have to do all this hard work, you're gonna have to assault each other, and drive through the uh, target area to pick up your precious cargo and save a guy. So they had to pick up a body and grab a big box of stuff. And then the first ones to the uh, pickup zone for the helicopter would be the winner. Mm -hmm. And uh, But inside the uh, precious cargo box, right, was a bunch of beer. So you work hard, you get to the LZ, you pick up, oh, you're the winner, yay, you were the winner, and then open up those pressure cards, boys, and then grab a beer, you know, and talk about it. How, how did it go? Do an after action review with, with a couple of good beers, you know? Or you could go to a steak, uh, you know, go to a place where you're gonna make steaks and stuff, hang out. But it's just the hard work and then camaraderie afterwards. And that would, that's the biggest thing I miss about any of the, the places I've been is to, uh, you miss those guys, miss the men, miss the, the work. Rob Trevino talked about that one time uh, when I was with him with my friends saying, he said, uh, fighting, training, and drinking. <laughs> and, he was talk and he wasn't like making a flippant joke. He was just saying like you build relationships doing those things. Yes. You, and, and I thought about it at the time, like you think about like the time you're at a wedding or something and you meet somebody you never met, like, oh, that's my crazy uncle's, you know, friend so-and-so and you spend the whole evening telling jokes and drinking and dancing and then maybe you never see that person again but when you see them they're like hey! you know and they're like buddies because you got yeah. drunk together you know what i mean yeah. yeah or or suffering that was the other thing he's talking about through the training the suffering like oh i hear i'll hear guys talk about oh do you remember that time it was so f cold we were so wet we were so miserable and then there's like this bond because you yeah, suffered together yeah i love suffer well together that's what i it's what I would teach the kids when I when I went to. Uh, so I did a couple speeches for a couple different football programs in uh, Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, through the relationship with uh, Terre Haute SWAT is where okay. I was. Those guys are great, and uh, the SWAT commander's brothers 
are all, they're all football brothers, all of them. They're all giant humans, too. It's, it's, it's awesome. They're also great people. But uh, two of the brothers were football guys and football coaches. And, hey, can you come and talk to my, my kids? Mm -hmm. And he, hell yes, I would. Uh, the first time it was almost an ambush. He goes, I know you're here to do some training, but... I'm, I'm taking you to the high school. I'm like, what? I, I, I was sitting in Kevin's car, and I'm I'm writing furiously, and I'm trying to get some information there. What, what's the team like? Who's the oldest? Who's the youngest? You know, who are they going up against? I, I had to figure out all that crap before I could, you know, give a little speech. You know, a lot of it was off the cuff, but it was really cool. And uh, some of the best parts about that too is that the the year after that, I went back again, and then one of the kids that was there before, uh, he brought his mom and dad in. Because mom and dad were like, I gotta meet this guy. Because he can't stop talking about the time that we suffered well together with Dutch. Oh, and cool. Like, that's so cool, and that that's awesome to me. Um, that means a whole lot. So that's that's what I do. Dutch, uh, you you told me the story. So tell the listeners how a guy gets the name Dutch. Because you're not Dutch. No German. So somebody said, you, did you get that nickname because your love of German army history? No. <laughs> so Dutch came around when uh, my platoon sergeant, John Spizo, who's a great dude, by the way, and he wrote a leadership book as well. Um, he loved the movie Predator. And me and another cat would imitate Schwarzenegger. The other cat was Let's way better, it. way better. Let's hear it. Uh, so any quotes from there? But we were in, I'll, I'll get you one. We were in the jungles of Panama, and that's when John said, you're now Dutch. Because that was because he kept hearing you. That was do. Schwarzenegger's nickname in the uh, in the movie, right? So, uh, if it bleeds, you can kill it. You can kill it. You know. Uh, what is Anna? He's like Anna. No, I, what's the one scene where they're they're trying? To, she's starting to pick up a rifle, and he knocks it out of her hand. And he said, uh, "He won't shoot you. No sport. No sport." He said, sport. Uh, but he goes on and on, right? So there's all kind of stuff. You're like Dylan, you know. What, uh, the CIA got you pushing too many pencils, you know? <laughs> whatever, bullshit, bullshit like that. But so when so I, you guys would just be screwing around yeah, and saying it. He was like, nah, that's it, you're Dutch. And then when I got to a better place in my career, they're like, you can't bring a nickname with you. I'm like, fine, I, I don't want a nickname, I want to be here. I don't care, make my new nickname, whatever, you know. Give, give me my new Delta Chi nickname. Is a flounder, right? That's a movie quote. Mm -hmm. uh, Animal House flounder. Um, and so, but men that came before me knew me as Dutch, and then guys that came after me still knew me as Dutch. My nickname in, uh, in training was Dutch, so it stuck. It just stuck. Stuck. I was telling you yesterday, too, they tried to change it to Simon because I had fired a standoff breaching round at a, at a car during a, a train-up, and the car skin, the door skin, came back and smashed me in the face. Broke your neck. Broke my neck, broke my jaw. I lost six teeth, and uh, I asked him how long he was out of work after that. Thirty days. Okay. But it was thirty and change. With a broken neck and a broken jaw. Yep. So they didn't wear, have to wire you shut. Yeah, I wired it for thirty days. That was it. Milkshakes, baby. Mm -hmm. Milkshakes. <laughs> but they they tried to call me Simon. And it just didn't stick. Why Simon? Because it was the name of the Simon. Oh 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 yeah. The projectile. Yeah hey, yeah I got you. So it was kind of cool. And that one didn't stick. Didn't stick. So Dutch survived. To the point that your business name is even... Me, yeah, so I started that whole business because I loved... I like NASCAR, I like motorsports. And I, I, before I got out, I'm like, I'm never carrying a rifle or a pistol around again. I'm done with this life. And uh, that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. What did you want to do? So I wanted to, I wanted to do an off-road shop and race and blah, blah, blah. This is like build? Yeah. Uh, Build, fix, race, and then you and you, you can, your customers come on in. You know, we'll we'll put a suspension on your car. We'll do this or your truck. So we did trucks and ATVs. Me and another guy, and it was actual wrenching. Oh yeah, the mm -hmm. whole deal, suspension, all that stuff. Uh, we did a whole bunch of Ford Raptors. We did uh, a bunch of F one fifties. We did uh, a bunch of ATVs, Chevys. What have we did off here? So. We had a shop on a piece of farmland, and we were kind of, you know, it's 180 acres of farm. You're yeah. talking like 10 years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Eight, yeah, so 2012, 
right before I got out, I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. So that's when I made DCM off road. Ah. And a lot of those NASCAR guys uh, have their initials. That's, you know, Joe Gibbs Racing. It's JGR or whatever. Gotcha. So, um, so I was like, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm going to do that. But if you want to make money, hear, hear me, hear me now, believe me later. But if you want to make money in that business, if you want to make a million dollars in that kind of business, start off with two million. Because <laughs> that's, dude, I'm telling you right now, all I did was spend money. Um, just equipment and... Yeah, and if you you want to build a truck and you want to race it, so it costs money, okay, fine. So I was telling you last night, so we took a 2010 Ford Raptor when the Raptor came out, and we I poured 150K in that thing. We made it into basically like a 7200 series truck, so pro stock. Uh, new suspension, new everything. We did a lot of work to that car. Anyway, uh, and I promptly took it to, we did a Vegas, the Vegas big loop, 800 mile off-road event, and it broke it. And it, it's gotta be fixed, because you wanna take it to another event. No, I gotta pay for it. And you got, logistically, right, I'm it's stupid. Logistically, I'm in North Carolina. All the cool desert racing is in the desert. <laughs> Whether it's the High Desert Racing Association of Texas and New Mexico, or it's out in Chandler, Arizona, or it's Phoenix, so you're or Barstow. Yeah, yeah, so logistically that's stupid. You got a trailer to this thing. Um, we made some noise. It was cool. And then, you know. <laughs> Just absorb too much resources. That I gotta go back to my strengths. Yeah. Plus I missed it. Yeah. And now I found a, I think I found a happy place for me, so. You can still do those things, but yeah, that, that I think something like that, in order to develop a name, you gotta have that thing out there racing, winning, or at least placing, and people seeing the coolness, and so your marketing is the $2 million you're talking about. Yeah. A lot of money. Yeah. I watched that documentary or that series about Formula One, and I never really was, I like cars and trucks, but I never was into like racing, like I never, captured me like the concept and did you see that series on Netflix it's just it, I didn't realize the amount of money that these race teams like Formula One teams Shoot. spend because that is not that popular here in the States you know with football baseball I mean it's popular but not like in other parts of the world and these teams like hundreds of millions of dollars traveling around and everywhere they go there's these huge parties and uh, fireworks and craps going off and well, like then the car hits the wall in the first 30 seconds and that's that's it the whole race is over and they yeah. spent like four million dollars to yeah. go there and they set the whole thing up and, the, and they're like oh shit I guess we have to rebuild the car and then they're right back at it so millions yeah and millions and millions and millions. And I was an amateur I was nothing I mean I, I took a couple off-road courses what does that make me it's just so it's like when you when you do enough jujitsu or you do enough bag work to get your ass kicked in the bar mm -hmm. that's what we used to say but you, you learn just enough to get your ass, ass whipped in the bar so i mean i knew enough just to race hard and then crash so that's great oh, good job mm. <laughs> cost money to fix that it. sucks <laughs> that sucks so so you in the ranger regiment first one seven or one seven five down there in Savannah, and then you decided to move on, which you did to the, your your uh, final career. You retired as a sergeant major. Did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's a sergeant major do? Uh, whatever he wants. Ooh. <laughs> a joke. I know. I just that was in my response was a joke too. <laughs> so the problem with this guy is he thinks he's funny. Oh. Uh, oh man. Keep going. <laughs> So what? So, as a as a J shock as a J SOC, tell them what J SOC is. Joint Special Operations Command. So it's the top tiers of all the Navy, Air Force, Marines, Army. Um, you know, Marine Special Operations Command. It's a part of J SOC. The the Navy has is part of you know, there's a part, sliver of the Navy SEALs that are part of J SOC, etc. So uh, as a how do I put it? So where I came from, um, you could be a you be a sergeant major and still be a shooter. Yeah. So you don't have to be in a command position, right? So there's only one real sergeant major that's part of the battalion. You know what I mean? So the battalion sergeant major 
he's in charge of all, basically of all the Rangers in the battalion. That's like in a company, that'd be like a vice president of operations or so, something. Yep, because there's a commission officer, obviously, they're teamed with the commission officer, he's a non commission officer. He'd be like the CEO, yeah. CFO kind of guy. CFO, mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, that's different though. Where I graduated to, you're just, you're just another guy, you're just a shooter. Mm. And by just a shooter, it means you're still out doing the same work you did when you were a lesser yep. rank. Yep. It just means you retire with more pay. I did retire with a, with a decent paycheck, yep. Good. Not enough to keep racing $150,000 trucks. But no. I need to build one of those. Not, a, not enough to have a studio like this. We all make choices, don't we? I made a, I now wait, you could it. have, but you crashed it in the desert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I burned some money. I burned some money. Yeah, we all have. We're well, all that, but that's like we're talking about the failure. Is it really? You like you learn. And it's like all right. I wanted to do this thing. I mean, I don't. I screwed up and wasted so much resources making wrong choices, and I don't so much anymore. But yeah, you kind of. Well, isn't that, isn't that the difference between a loser and failure? Yeah. So if you fail and fail and fail and never learn, then you become a loser. You're a loser. But if you fail and fix it, yep. not necessarily a loser. Yep. So. Your mom was right. <laughs> <laughs> You're a loser. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So DCM. Now we started talking about this earlier. You're out taking the things that you learned from your 26 slash 31 years in service and passing it on. You do some leadership stuff. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, leadership, I, uh, I know guys that came from similar place, same place as you that have talked to me about doing leadership stuff. And it's like, just cause you served in a certain capacity doesn't mean that you're a good leader or good at, uh, passing on, or, or doesn't even mean you're a good teacher. So you could be like the world's baddest ass operator ever, but it doesn't mean you're good at teaching sure. in the construction world. I read a book years ago. Uh, Walt Steppleworth was the author, and he talks about um, he called it an entrepreneurial seizure. And in this uh, book, he's con this was written in the '80s. He's talking to like. Uh, people that are going to get in the construction trades and start businesses. And he said, just because you're a great plumber doesn't make you a great plumbing business owner or a great carpenter doesn't make you a great carpentry contractor. And so there's all these people that leave service and you need a job and you're young usually when you leave service versus like retiring from business because your job's so physical, right? And then, well, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to teach this thing that I did. And then a lot of these guys suck at teaching. And I'm not like naming anybody. I just no. mean, just because you did this thing doesn't mean you're a good business owner or a good instructor or a good trainer of whatever the said task is. Yeah, I, I, I hope, right? People out there can figure it out or you can tell me, but I hope because of the testimonials that I received that I'm a pretty good trainer. I hope so. Uh, I'm, I'll be honest with you right now. I, I don't run my business as well as I should at all. Why? Uh, why? Yeah. I hate it. I hate doing that crap. What do you hate? Like I hate the social media. Mm -hmm. I want this is what I want. <laughs> I want. Uh, I want a beach body while I eat potato no, chips no, and no, drink no, beer. Of course, <laughs> that's what I, I want. A, I want an operations sergeant major that says, "Hey, you're going to Cleveland tomorrow." Yeah. Hey. All you guys all say to, the same thing. We're going to Arizona tomorrow. Roger that. So you can have one of those. That manager will cost you like seventy-five to hundred grand a year. Right. So once yeah. I once I build it up a little bit and get where you are, maybe. But why do you even want to do that? Do you need to travel <laughs> around like that? I love travel. But okay, so that's actually not hard. So like if you guys are listening and you're like, hey, well we'll have Dutch come out. So all you gotta do is just go on his social media, send a message and a dick pic, and he will set up a <laughs> That's how he quantifies where he's going, <laughs> or at least cate categorizes. That's what I told people the other day. I, I helped. Uh, I sat in for Pat McNamara mm -hmm. on the the squad on his, podcast. On his it was awesome, man. It was awesome. So here's what I tell people: If you have a place that has good assets, right? You have a good range, good assets. You got some steel, got some targetry. Uh, you know, where and a place where you can shoot, move, and communicate without having to uh, to take a SRO course or some sort of safety range officer BS. Because there are places like that that want you to do that. And I'm like, no, no. Do I have to send you my DD-214? Let's not do that. So, but if there's somebody out there who has a place, so we do 10 people, like, 
I'm a big fan of 10. I think instructing 10 is perfect. Uh, but if that one person has that place, he shoots for free. See, the others will pay the price. But if you can manage it, get the place, let me know where it is, boom, that shooter shoots for free. We always say, I, I tell folks, if it's safe and legal, I'm in, like, because there's places I showed up. Like, remember when we did the first S12? This place was a range under construction in, in South Carolina outside Myrtle Beach. And uh, I was down there. He and I went down to, like, check it out. And it'll, it'll be done, bulldozing. It's been raining. It's muddy. We show up months later. It's mud this deep. Ugh. Tree roots, you know, turn. It, was, it looked like, it looked like uh, somebody bombed the place and then it rained for a month is what it looked like it was a forest that was they let lit my lion it was ruined so we're like okay well this is great so like you know it was, it was yeah, cool. it looked like a hurricane it, war it, zone exactly was exactly it looked like, like a hurricane knocked all the trees I mean, over there's, there's freaking it, it, it was the only thing it was missing was alligators and like uh pits with spikes sticking up in them right yeah right. but people or i've done i've done one or guys sent me pictures and i show up and i'm like you're berm is the neighbor's property like you're literally like like you understand this right, right. like we're shooting at your neighbor's farm like we can't do that why not we do it all the time like you can but I you know so yeah that, that safe and legal is what we always say so you guys listening and we'll get you all this contact information you can set it up and do it too um and we started to talk earlier your your specialty like is uh the CQB and shooting stuff. So yeah. what is somebody gonna learn from you? I tell this to students all the time, and you'll, uh, I think, agree with me. If you don't, you're wrong. But um, like guys that come from where you worked are not the greatest shooters in the world. You're good at it in the context of shooting bad people. So like there's competitive shooters that'll shoot faster and oh, all that stuff. Completely correct. So, guys, from where you're from, go get those guys to come and say, hey, so-and-so, you're like a national or world champion, you know, teach us some teach shit me. about yeah. shooting the pistol or the rifle. And, and, and so that's what I think is cool about that section of our military is it's not the um, regurgitation of material as I heard it and understand it. It's let me go find the subject matter expert on blah 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 and he or she can explain it. So did, did you ask a question? Yeah, so the question is what are they really gonna what are they gonna get I did. What are they gonna gather from you? That's unlike anybody else? Not just unlike anybody else. So, so here's the other thing I'll I'll predicate my question on. There fifty thousand people can show you how to mount a rifle or hold a pistol or engage targets or track through your sites etc like what is like what's your you know mindset on training and all that good stuff yeah no it's, it's a valid question it really is you know besides having a good time and movie quotes i like those things i hope you gotta have that right yeah. you have to yeah. you have to um but besides all those things i hope that i can bring to a shooter um i hope i can bring to them small tips, tricks, and advice on how you're gonna wear your armor, how you're gonna wear your concealment gun, uh, and all because of the, the crap that I've done, mm -hmm. right? And It's not antidotal, you know. No, no, and, and, and because of the ammo issues right now, we can't do a whole lot of this, right? A lot of people don't, they get scared of pulling the trigger, because every time you pull the trigger, it's like 95 cents right now. Uh, but I still would, if I did a shooting program, if I did a real deal shooting program slash CQB week, I mean, we'd shoot a lot of, a lot of ammunition. We'd shoot a lot. How much? A lot. Thousands? So if I do, oh yeah, easily. If it's a whole week, and it depends on how much okay. the, the department has, right, or your contract has, will allow you to shoot, but we shoot a lot. Thousands? Yeah, I would, certainly, I would say that. 10 guys, 10 guys over two days, even even two days, right? Even if I do a, if I do a rifle course for one day, I would say bring 500 to 700 rounds of ammunition. And then that's, and people look at that and go, oh my God, right? That's $700 on top of the cost of the program. Oh, that, or it's the the logistical portion for the student, right? I gotta drive or fly to that place, wherever that place might be. And then there's uh, there's there's food, there's lodging, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, pulling the trigger a lot helps. Um, what was it, Gladwell? Is it Gladwell? Mm -hmm. Malcolm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, 10,000 10, hours to be an expert. I submit to you, you're past that point. Uh, I submit to you, I'm past that point. Um, and then when shooters get the idea where, well, I can only shoot 200 rounds because I can't afford it. Well, that's, that's part of that 10,000 hour portion. Whether that's true or not, it doesn't matter. But you're not getting the trigger time and you need the trigger time. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get the trigger time, you're not getting close to that 10,000 hours to become an expert. Uh, I hope though that I can bring, so um, just a quick example, I guess. I was in West Texas and let's just do a quick evaluation. Let's see, and then you gotta see where your demographics of the shooters are too, right? Some, somebody might be very, very, uh, very good, might, you know, better than you they might be. Uh, but the other one, the 10th guy, that 10%, right, he needs all the attention it usually works that way, yeah. yeah and, and you may not be able to hand them all the attention, but as a true as a trainer too, and I've been to different courses too. I think we talked about this once before, but I've been to courses where they are the course itself is stamped out, right? So it's this section is this amount of time, and then we're off the range. We're going to do something else. But we're going to talk about some of the things that we did, and then we're going to go back. Boom, boom, boom. So it's these time. How do I articulate right here? These these moments in time, right? The hour or the second hour or whatever they are, they're already dedicated to something. So if there's a ten percent guy on the range who's no good, he's he gets lost in sauce. Yeah. He still gets lost. Yeah. What I want to do on the range is actually teach and help that guy too. It's not just a block of instruction and then see you later bye. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to be able to help that guy or that girl shoot properly or at least come away with with at least oh yeah okay now i have a building block i can take this home with me and say well now i can dry fire now i can i can start to draw stroke or whatever from concealment or from outside wherever it might be but at least now he's he's a little bit better i just can't i just can't let him be uh i just can't let that one shooter go down the hill right so there'll be teaching involved um and then the back to the western texas thing uh so when you do that quick evaluation, and then you're going like, okay, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Let me show you. Like I told you uh, before, if I saw a constabulary, if I went and, and contracted with a, a police force and, and said, okay, I'm gonna watch you do CQB first, and then we'll talk about the things that I think could help you better, worse, let's try this, let's try that. Uh, same thing with the equipment, right? Same thing with kit. Or the same thing with a open enrollment civilian shooter. If we're watching, you know, I'm gonna watch that first Evaluation. I go okay. Try this instead. Um, this will help you reload your magazines faster. This will help you, you know, pull your gun out faster or whatever. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully, I answer the question. I mean, maybe not. I'm just rambling now, but I think what I'm hearing is that you uh, don't just teach a rope course of fire. You make sure that you're bringing all the students up, regardless of their current skill set when I they arrive. So. That class. I certainly so that's hope what so. I heard. I certainly hope so. Yeah, that's actually challenging. Um, I would, without sounding uh, like I'm bandwagoning, that's a thousand percent what we do. And I tell folks, hey, if you're freaking awesome and it's boring because we're taking the guy or a person that's low, keep getting reps while we're working with him. And then, like, if you're all of these people, especially where we teach all of them are like the gun guy in their group so they're teaching to their buddies or their kids trying to train yeah so i'm like so you can get from this you know the guy down here that's messed up you can see like how to fix this problem and it, at the very least it's like and for me i'm setting in their head there's value here even if you don't see it so shut the f up and pay attention you know like that yeah or even if the ammo shortage thing too if you don't think that you want to spend, if you only bring 300 rounds of ammunition and we're going to shoot 700 if, if we can, still going through the uh, mm -hmm. going through the motions is still going to help, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. Um, but Let's talk about dogs. Four legs. Four tails. legs. Yes. T delicious. Ears. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> go. So, so yummy. So you uh, were also a dog handler. I did. I was able to handle a dog in combat. And you talked a little bit about some of the history of that in uh, the American services. Talk a little bit about that. Because now it's so uh, uh, ubiquitous. You see 
memes and pictures and everybody's got Malinois and and everybody's got like I mean you go to like shot show and you see 500 of them walking yeah, around with backpacks and goggles and um, advertising uh, yeah yeah and 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 like there's stuffed animals uh, that look look like them sitting you know proudly with their ears up with the goggles and stuff they're just everywhere everywhere now which is not a bad thing no it's not a bad thing it's it's funny though uh, they exploded right right after after 9 11 right pretty much the whole the whole industry exploded mm -hmm. and then it was dogs overseas what were like uh, what was what did k2 call the tip program or whatever there was the the bomb detection dogs mm -hmm. you know, that the Marines would use and uh, and Von Lick Kennels was involved in that. Uh, it, had a huge, it just exploded, man. That whole thing went crazy. Um, I primarily worked uh, with human interdiction animals, right? That's what I would call them. Fancy word for attack bite, dogs. Bite dog, bite dog, yeah. yeah. But we call it so a single purpose patrol animal. You know, then you have a dual purpose animal who is patrol and he can snap out drugs for police officers or explosives right so our our program really started just with patrol animals and then you know some guys that were smarter than me said we we need to make these dual purpose so primary function is to interdict humans secondary function is to find in the hidden in the walls where the guys are keeping the bombs so you instead of you guys having to tear the house apart they'd Snip it out. You go oh, right yeah. to it. They did. They did a lot of great work. That's cool. And I never had a bomb dog. I just never did. Okay. It was I had two uh, patrol dogs. I, I I think I probably worked with four or five, but two that I held on my on my hip in combat. So uh, save lives, man. They save lives. It's the cheapest, best way to save lives, without a doubt. Um, was we we're talking about the flashbang, right? So if you're whether you're a law enforcement or military, one of the things to help your your men, right? Protect your force, throw the flashbang in before you clear the structure, right? So it's a distraction. The animal is a live fighting distraction. He can be reused over and over again. Banger goes off, it's one time use, it's over. Dog goes in, he's 18 inches off the floor, He's it's in the dark, he's hard to see, he moves fast. He goes from zero to 35 miles an hour a second. Uh, and he's already clearing rooms before you even get to your point of domination. He can already tell, there's nothing here. I'm going to go over there. Um, now he's even deeper in the target. And you flood this thing, and he's already, he's, he is that live distraction way over there. Uh, barricaded enemy. Stairs. Where can you use a dog? Man, it's badass. They are badass. It was just recently canine... Somebody made this up. I don't know who did. It was Canine Veterans Day. Or something like it was like. Oh last, really? It's like last week. I saw I saw a couple of cool things. Uh, Ricky Hawk had he because he had a dog in combat. He had his uh, dog on a on, on a meme, whatever it was. I mean, IG. What's the coolest thing you ever saw a dog do? Push good guys out of the way to bite a bad guy. Oh yeah, you were telling me that. That is so cool to me. So it'd be like a dog pile of humans. Yep. And the dog would just you know just like a dog comes over to you and it, and it nudges your hand up to to pet me. I've seen with my dog actually Belko. He would push a dude out of the way to nail a guy. That's the that's like the pinnacle, right? That's exactly what you want, right? How how smart are you? How clever are you to be able to differentiate between friend and foe? That was magic, man. You know you. And, and there was a melee going yeah, on, melee. noise, and yeah, it wasn't just two people standing there. Nope. Which one do you bite? Yeah, I'm taking them down. Here comes an animal. I'll help. I'll help you. <laughs> get you out of the way. Get you out of the way. I'll nail it, dude. <laughs> I'm telling you, I get a little goose flesh. I mean, that that stuff is so cool. Um, or to watch them. It was the other thing. It wasn't my animal. It was uh, somebody else's. We were doing a training training thing. We were tracking uh, a person a thousand meters. Over a thousand meters through undulating terrain in the woods of Fort Bragg, and bam, I got you. He finds him, and I'm just God, man. This is that that's a thousand meters, man. Never knew is an unknown track, right? Mm -hmm. So, last time we saw the guy was here, 
and then through a thousand meters, off lead and on lead, he finds a guy. Yeah, that shit's badass to me. That's super cool. It's super Where you'd be just <laughs> yeah. walking in circles. We'll wait for an ISR platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, can we get a drone, please? Uh, and that's another thing too. So other stuff we've other stuff they did, man. So they would find guys in the woods, right in a palm grove, with ISR platform can't find them. Where your nods didn't work enough. Uh, maybe if it was even a diffusion goggles we used. Um, so you had thermal as well as the regular night vision. Can't find them, can't see them, don't find them. That's cool. The, the saving lives, that's the biggest thing, man. If if we lost 20 dogs in combat, that's at least 20 operators came on. And I'll tell you, like when Valco was killed, he probably saved four, four guys. Just in that instance yep. when it happened. Because the, where he found him, uh, where the ISR platform couldn't find him, where nobody else could see him, he was... When you say him, you're saying the bad guy. Yep, the bad guy. There was three or four operators basically online, so he had a chance to use invalid fire, uh, and then using that fire rate going down all through all the guys, you know, it's possible. Certainly but it didn't happen because didn't happen. he was there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's, so, that's awesome. That's the stuff that, and it's a labor of love too, right? So it's, it's a pain in the balls. Sometimes it's a complete pain in the ass. You How a, so? You have a three-year-old on a leash. Okay. He's really excited. <laughs> the, He's excited about everything, you know. Hey, hey, you know. Can you imagine, right? And, it, and you got to calm his ass down. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're compromised and stuff like that. You got he's got to be quiet, um, and he's right there on you. God bless, man. What a pain in the ass it can be sometimes. Yep. And you got to take care of him, of course. You got to feed him. You know, he's a living, breathing tool. So it's not like the rifle. If you didn't shoot tonight, put the rifle in the kit. You know, in your kit. Mm -hmm. Come. Different. It's uh, amazing how many people buy those breeds and don't realize how high strung and how high maintenance they <laughs> They're are. They're high drive animals, man. Most, yeah. of, most of the Malinois are through the roof drive. Yeah. Yep. yeah. You get ones, ones and twos that are cool. Yeah. You know, but yeah, most of them. It depends on what you want, too. You could you probably find those Malinois that are much more relaxed, friendly. But uh, yeah, you want a dog that's going to run through fire. Or enemy fire to help you out. That's that's a special super high drive animal. It's cool. Get on a helicopter. Let's get on a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know most I mean? dogs don't even like a no, vac vacuum they don't like cleaner. Loud noise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you got it. So and then you you attach that helicopter to a reward, right? Hmm. So that, and again, they're patrol dogs, so they're bike dogs. So you get a helicopter, uh, and it, and everything you all the training you do is successive approximation, right? This doctor speak for baby steps. Uh, get him around the helicopter first. Get him in and out of the helicopter first. It's, it's not even spinning. Yet. Just sitting there on yeah, the tarmac. Yeah, it's not even spinning. Yet. Let's play. Let's play a ball. It's, or maybe it just well, whatever. Play with a ball, whatever. And then it's spin up, you know. And then get the totally like, right. Yeah, yeah, get yeah, yeah. What's this? Hey, but you're still fun here. We play. Yeah, yeah don't worry cool. about it's that. No big deal. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And then it fly around. And then you fly around. And then oh, there's a there's a guy to bite. Let's and go now, get him. Now, now after that. Every time we hear the helicopter, they're like, oh. <laughs> I get to bite somebody. It's time to go, right? Just like a hunting dog seeing the camouflage and blaze orange hat coming Big out. Time. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, even your house dog, right? So your house dog knows it's time to go on a walk. So you get the leash out, you get the collar out, whatever. And it's like time to go on a walk. They get excited. Yeah, oh, time to awesome. Go on a walk. So when you're in the team room putting your kid on, oh. They're in the kennels. They're in the kennels. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Can we go, can we go, can we go? Yeah, that's really cool. I'm going to eat somebody. I remember uh, my, my buddy Scott would say, where's this go? And he'd hold up a flat collar. We ran the dogs on a on a, a live lead chain and a, and a flat collar. He would say, where's this go? And the dog would shove their head right in there. Yeah, you know, you know, it's time to get some work in. You were telling me yesterday about the one dog uh, that you just met, uh, that you just were talking about, how he'd come back after you guys... Excuse me, we're out doing your work and everybody'd come love on him. And oh, yeah, him. he was he was a lover. Yeah. We had a bench out in... Uh, Which I brought it up because a lot of times working dogs, people are like, you don't treat them like that. Correct. Yeah, yeah some of them are itchy. They're real itchy. Kotha, my second dog, was so... Nobody wanted to talk to him. Nobody. Just me. He was edgy. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't mess with him. Um, Jura was Scott's dog. He was a great dog. And you... 
the the integrated team, the pack, right, right in your own room or whatever, he was fine with them. But strangers, uh, even he was no fail during CQB work, right? He was awesome. But if you were in a relaxed environment and somebody came up and said, "Hey," and they wasn't really part of the thing, mm, you know, he would give you the "Don't come near me." Yes. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Valco, we had a bench outside of the. Uh, like a barracks in Al Assad, where the, the old Soviet uh, airfield that the Iraqis used, uh, that we we of course took it, and uh, we, the engineers had built a bench out there, like big table type thing, and he would sit on top. He would just sit there. Everybody come by. What's up? What's up? So, yeah. He was cool like that. Yeah, but though. he was fierce though too. That's cool. What did so you say? Cool. Fierce. Fierce as he well. Was. Yeah, he was. So he was well-rounded individual. He would. He was the guy that would push you out of the way. To get his game on, right? Get my show. Don't stop me from getting a taste. He was super fun. Yeah. No cock blocking, Dad. I need some. <laughs> yeah. He would engineer his own shit too. He would engineer his own bites. I would swear to God, dude. You know, if I'm I'm under Nas and I'm doing something over here, and he'd be like, "There's a dude over here." No, no, he'd already been packaged. They're they're all lined up. We got guys lined up against the wall. He'd be like. <laughs> 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 hey, this guy's already packaged. There's no, you know, no more of that. Oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah. Is that a war crime? That dog. Oh, would you be the judge of that? Yeah, that's funny. I mean, it's not funny that somebody that was in cuffs got bit, but it's funny that the well, dog... Well, you would try. Yeah, okay. He would just try. He'd be like... Mm. Just knows. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you, man. I swear to God. And then that's... you had to tell people, too, because after you package these people up, you have to... You have to make sure, like the Rangers are briefed, or somebody's briefed, don't put the EPW anywhere near me. Don't put them near the, the dog. Because the dog will eat them. Because we're asking them to do that, right? So it ain't wrong. Right. This is the thing. This is what you need to do. Right. So it was a... Uh, it's like when your dog. It's like like when a homeowner gets angry because the dog's barking because somebody's outside the house. What are you supposed to do? Yeah, he's doing what, what he's... You manage what you should reward him yeah. you know, a little bit. Uh, is it an annoyance? Sure, but he's doing exactly what he needs to do. Mm -hmm. Hey, pop, 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 pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> or whatever he's saying. Mailman, hey, hey, mailman, hey, hey, hey. mailman, mailman. What did you see the far side? Remember the far side cartoons? Oh yeah, yeah. You know what, Ginger? <laughs> what? Is, hey, Ginger. What? What? what is, it's, hey, 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 hey. What, <laughs> yeah. what Ginger really says? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Um. Quick anecdotal story. In the beginning, uh, when we stayed at the mission support site, uh, right off the Tigris, there's like an estuary of the Tigris and Baghdad. And we didn't really do much yet. It, I mean, we did some stuff, but not much. And uh, there was a time when some bad guys had driven a van up uh, along this estuary and we caught them. And then it was, you know, get the word. Hey, hey, there's some, there's some dudes down there. And we go running out there in shorts. Maybe throw you on your armor. And you're running down there in shorts, though. Stupid. Um, we go down there. I went down there with the dog. We had, we had like 10 prisoners, I guess. I'll say 10 for fun. I mean, it might have been eight, but whatever. It was a nice line of people. And we, you know, we didn't have cuffs, nor did we have hoods yet. We just hadn't had them or it was too quick to go get them, whatever. I got their van, they had RPGs and r machine guns and grenades and shit in the, in the van. And uh, we snatched them all out. And when I got there, our guys had put all the EPWs with uh, hands on their shoulders, right? Shirts over top of their heads for the makeshift, uh, hoods. Make makeshift hoods. And it was hands on shoulders, never letting go until we tell you to, that kind of thing. And we're marching them up to a place where we can uh, house them for now, put them in, so before we can take them to the real EPW place, whatever. And uh, there's a command that the dogs understand called transport. Transport allows the police officer, because these dogs have a police background. Uh, they come from Holland. And they have a lot of training on them, right? So the police officer is able to put his hand on the perp with his right side exposed so he can draw a gun if needed and the dog is on the left hand side of the perp and he bounces up and down barking 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 transport means you know he can't he can't touch him but i can create this 
fear and let, oh, yeah. you, let you know I'm right as next to you. As soon as he you. bolts, dog attacks. As soon as he attacks the handler, dog attacks. That's that's the that's the. So in training them, you do this to the guy that's got the padded suit on. If he takes off running, yeah, dog. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If, or if he turns on the handler, yeah. Bite. Okay. Right? So here we are, real life. This is the dogs hadn't had any bites yet. I want to say once they bite a human too, they understand it exponentially. It, the things take off, and it's like I told you, like he could push you out of the way. He knew who the bad guy was, and so he is. I tell him transport, transport. <laughs> he starts parading up and down this 10-man crew. And he's barking <laughs> and barking and spit is flying. <laughs> and he's, could you just imagine, I can't see. And this monster is raw, 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 raw. And he's parading up and back like a shepherding dog, like he's supposed to. And, he, and the last guy, though, the last guy got the worst of it. He probably bit everybody at least once. But the last guy, because he was last, kabow, kabow. Every time he kabow. And we didn't discipline him because we wanted them to get dirty. You know? Sure. And it was the funniest thing you've ever seen. Hey, uh, hey, uh, and everybody gets some. Everybody got at least one bite. Except the guy in the back, I'm telling you, he got more than one, right? He nailed him a couple of times. And they, these weren't bite and holds. They weren't ripping flesh off. Just a, just a snap a bite. Yeah, yeah. Snap, just like you could imagine him hurting sheep. It was just like that. <laughs> But I, I, I still can look back in my mind. How, you know, it was hot. He's got spittle coming out of his mouth, and then he's gonna nail you. And now you've been bit once, right? And you're you're walking, you're walking. Is he gonna come again? Is he gonna come? How how terrifying might that be? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's horrible. It's a funny thing because you want this to happen, right? Because it's a reward too. Because you're like every time he bites. So if you're a trainer, right? A decoy. If you're in a decoy suit, you become the trainer. And once he's biting, you pay him by, ah, oh, this is a payment. Interesting. They live for this, right? They, this helps them understand that that's what they want. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I'm vanquishing my brain. And so now each guy's getting, ah, oh. And he's getting paid every time, right? Catch out, catch out, catch out. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. That's it was funny. The, it was the funniest thing. That dog, he was awesome. That's, anyway, that's I, I would have been upset. That's my stupid I don't like funny story. Bit. <laughs> you know, no, of course. Who would want to get bit? No. I got bit. Sure. I appreciate you coming out and chatting with us. I always ask folks uh, if you never meet the people or or connect with the people that have listened or viewed this discussion what would you leave them with it doesn't have to be anything about business or life or work it could be whatever if you only met if i only crossed your way once what would you tell me uh take it easy on the dick jokes not me, <laughs> not me. <laughs> you said me i'm, I'm kidding but, but, but me i'm okay. totally kidding so i but that i got it i got it i don't it. know I, what, I, what do you, you know, i don't know what do you what do you you know it's what that's your 30 second elevator speech right uh could be be kind be kind okay yeah. is that how you feel no no is that what's in your heart <laughs> christopher is that what's I'm, in your heart I'm a christopher black heart. It's black black heart no seriously though i guess what i would leave anybody with was you know do well, do things well. Whatever it is you're gonna do, do it well. Uh, with Don Brasso say, crush it, crush everything, right? I, I, why not? Do it well. I do make fun of him and I like Dom. I like, like I'm going to my grandma's funeral. I'm gonna crush it, <laughs> you know? Or, or, or uh, uh, my kid just took a terrible diarrhea all over the crib. I'm going to crush cleaning that up. You know, like there's certain things like... Well, yeah, 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 maybe not everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, but that's... I, I, but I agree. Just stay motivated, stay in the fight, you know, pay attention. That's another thing I would say to people, I guess. Pay attention to what's happening in your circle, your tribe, and then expand it. Make it bigger. Make your circle bigger. Hey, pay attention, my God, pay attention to what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what's happening in politics. I don't want to see that. I don't want to watch that. You know, get your head out of the Kardashian's ass and watch the news. Go find news from a trusted source. Uh, and what, what's the other mantra that you and I talked about a long time ago? Find a trusted agent and train. Because What's a trusted agent to you? 
somebody with a good background, someone who's knowledgeable, someone who someone who can show you the right way by demo, demonstrating the right way. Uh, and somebody who's humble enough to know that he's not the end-all be-all, he or she is a trainer. Mm -hmm. And go find another trainer. Find numerous trainers. You know, you stick to one thing all the time, what does that, what does that get you? I don't know. Um, find other trainers, find other techniques, and find those, those people that have been there and done it, mm -hmm. and, and can offer you uh, a way, a, you know, a way to, in your evolutionary gunfighter path. I mean, we are all about guns here. We're talking, uh, but about life. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about guns, obviously. That's what we do now. How do people find you? So right now, uh, my my shit's weak. See, my shit's weak. No, that's it see, is. that's that's weakness. Saying that it's not weak. It's here. Weak. No, it's not. No. <laughs> no, I know that you haven't had much adversity in life or <laughs> challenges. But um, that's a joke. I got a lot of adversity. I know, it was a joke. It's good. What's your uh, no. Instagram handle? Yeah, so right now, Instagram handle is DCM Consulting Actual. And why is it actual? Because last year I got booted from Instagram because someone was pretending to be me. And then they turned the tables on me. DCM um, Consulting Actual. You got a website? So the website is I'm about eighty five percent solution right now. But is if is there a web address that if they go there, there's an email that they can send. No, the right now I don't have a web address. Right now, the website link will be in the bio, right? It'll be right on top. It'll be highlighted there. So Instagram is the best place to find you. Correct. Are you on and, Facebook? No, I'm not on Facebook. And the other one is DCM Consulting Actual at gmail.com. So there we go. That's me. Okay. So emails. IG, you can DM me. Uh, hey. Hey. DCM Consulting Actual at gmail.com. That's it. Easy. That's it. So easy. <laughs> I appreciate you coming down and sharing some of your stories with us. Everybody that comes in here, we have them sign this and you put today's date on it. Today's the uh, 20th. So while he's doing that, I'll tell you guys go ahead. Yeah, go Get ahead. Up. Yeah. You can push that chair out of the way if you need to. Do check him out. Uh, there's some of the some of the people that uh, uh, he and I found out while talking that uh, we have mutual friends, guys that he served with or worked with that I happen to be friends with, and one or two of them are uh, close friends and mentors of mine. Uh, not even in the training world, but just their friends. Uh, one of them, I help them with some political stuff, and it's such a small community of people uh, across the country that that do what uh, Chris did in his career that uh, we're honored to have him here. We're honored to be able to do some more filming with him today and I suggest that you give him a follow on social media and if you uh, or your range or your group or your department is looking for some excellent training uh, I can tell you that you'll get it with him. So be well, don't be dickheads, tell somebody you love them and please in the comments Put down what you liked about this discussion, what you didn't like. Tell Drew what you loved about his editing skills, how he uh, lowered the volume of Dutch's booming voice to make it sound like it was in line with mine, because Drew worked very hard to make the audio good. Peace. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com. Said I got me some
Some gunfire 